But right now, I'd like to introduce you to Professor Michael Fisher. You heard him speaking when he interjected concerning the, um, the little robots, the micro robots. Well, there's uh, not much what, that I want to say. And in fact, I said I wouldn't say anything, but I promised that I would do what I have done, and you heard me do it, interrupt. Uh, and when I thought I could add to the discussion. And so I think that's what I still want to do. Uh, I was born in Trinidad, actually. Uh, we lived in Point Fortin. My father worked for Shell Oil. He had worked there originally in Venezuela and transferred. Uh, and uh, I had to explain why it was I was born in Trinidad. And the first thing is it's really hard to be born somewhere where your mother isn't. <laughs> and uh, then my mother was married to my father, and he had a job in Trinidad. So that's how I came to be born here. My father came back to visit. He lost his job in the depth of the Depression. He had to go back to London, where he had originally come from. Uh, but I'm not going to go into my previous history from that. It gets stated to say that his father came from a little village yeah, a little Jewish village near Riga, which has been plowed into the ground, as far as I can tell, uh, since the Jews weren't very popular in that area. And uh, my mother, on the other hand, came from Strasbourg, Lorraine, was brought up a good Roman Catholic. So we have various backgrounds, and one of the things that I'm proud of in Trinidad is the wide variety of backgrounds. We essentially here represent the whole world. Uh, I heard from my father that uh, when it came to the looks of young ladies, uh, he found the Chinese combination with the African. Some of them. <laughs> okay. So uh, I also learned from my father. I was brought up with Calypso, as I have a list of them here. If anyone's curious, uh, the uh, first one is uh, King George's Silver Jubilee, which was 1925. That was a Calypso by Lord Beginner. But it was also explained to me by my father that if the Calypso singer wanted to say some things that weren't all that appropriate, then he turned into patois. <laughs> and uh, I'm told, I'm very happy that uh, uh, there's a lady here uh, whom I met through her son that understands patois. But I'm told by Nagla that it's not, a, not, not something that she's even heard or familiar with. Yeah, <laughs> very good. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to sit down now. Uh, I'm interested in all things. I think one of the crucial things of science is you never believe everything you hear. Uh, you take it some things on trust. You have to, but you take them with a, a pinch of salt, and then you would really questions. And so a thing to encourage amongst young people, and this goes back to a very early ages, four, five, six on, as soon as they can essentially speak, and you have to remember that they understand well before they can speak, uh, what are their thoughts about and what are they being told, and should they believe everything. And it's very important that one realizes that nothing is absolute. And as Dr. Guru rightly said, there are no miracles, uh, one has to work hard. Uh, things have improved, but they're not at a perfect stage. And similarly, when it comes to the business aspects, well, you have to say, well, how are we going to cope with that? And uh, if you look back and you find some wonderful inventions fell by the wayside, and others, as they became very popular, became much cheaper and became universal, and then those eventually dropped by the wayside too. So I've said more than enough now. I could go on talking for an hour, as you can probably gather already. And I will look forward to hearing what the other speakers have to say. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor Fisher. Well, just a little bit about Professor Fisher. Fellowship is something quite common in his case. Being a fellow and a former vice president of the Royal Society of London, a fellow of the American Philosophical Society, and a foreign associate of the United States of America's National Academy of Sciences. He is known primarily as a theoretical scientist who has worked in the areas of statistical physics, the theory of condensed matter and physical chemistry, but he is also eminently associated with the foundational and mathematical problems sh such as the two tuplets, am I pronouncing that properly? Tuplets, the tuplets. Well, I don't know how Turpel is said it himself. 
<laughs> Makes me feel a lot better. His early work includes numerical analysis and analog computation, which encompass the construction of an ultra high speed electronic analog computer. Now, analog computers were quite a while ago. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> high speed analog. Contributions to the modern theory of critical phenomena, renormalization groups, and phase transitions are influential points to note as well. In more recent years, he has picked up biophysics and the dynamics of motor proteins. He has published over 450 research articles and has guided over 30 graduate students and more than 50 postdoctoral associates. Among other honors and awards, he received the Wolf Prize in Physics and, honor, and honorary doctorates from Yale University, Tel Aviv University, the Wiseman Institute, and the Ecole Normale Superior de Lyon. <laughs> so this, ladies and gentlemen, was Professor Michael E. Fisher. Let's give him a round of applause here. Well, now that you know a little bit more about him from what he has said and from the accolades I have mentioned, does anybody have any questions for him, for him or maybe possibly Professor Kalu at this time? I, I, I would like to ask Professor Fisher, what has been the significance of all this work in physics and fancy areas of mathematics? How has that helped? people in science and even ordinary people in terms of improvements in their lives? Well, for ordinary people in terms of improvements in their lives, there's nothing I would try and point to. <laughs> okay, other than one of the opportunities for people is to study and to develop their thoughts and their questions. And so my point is that science is about understanding. And understanding is something that varies a lot from person to person. And so when you still have questions, then your understanding is not complete. But if you feel satisfied and you want to get on with the job, which is the engineering aspect, and I should say that uh, I uh, was at one stage contemplated being an aeronautical engineer, then the question is how do we get things done? And one of the important things about the medical profession per se is, well, how do we actually get things done? And then there's the question of understanding. And so the problems I've got into, uh, and it turns out then that as soon as you get a certain level, your understanding depends on, well, can I phrase things in mathematical terms? And there are many different mathematicians and many different sorts of questions. But it all comes from questioning I'd like to understand. And so it's in those, those remote ways that I think that'll help. Uh, but, uh, one of my very talented students, also born in Trinidad, uh, came to the London University, was a lecturer at Jamaica first, uh, and uh, I think he might be appropriate to uh, be nominated for a prize in the future. But one of the things uh, he worked at, uh, having done uh, postdoctoral work with me in Cornell, he originally came to London, uh, well then he's been moving, moved, he, met, he married a, uh, an American black girl, so when I originally, uh, if I'm allowed a small joke, which I tested out on Joseph last night, <laughs> um, I, I, before taking him to the United States, uh, I was a little nervous. He'd been a couple of years in London. So I, there's a lot of prejudice in the United States one way or another. And there is, of course, in England too one way or another. It's very hard to avoid it. But so I asked him, well, um, Arthur, did you have any uh, problems in terms of um, your uh, being black and so on? And he said, no, no, I didn't require for anything. It was just this, those damn Jamaicans wanting to lord it over the Trinidadians. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, when he married uh, an American black girl, he got a slight different perspective. But these, when the story finished, he got a job with an IBM. He worked for them for many years, and he moved to Atlanta. He had two very talented children, both uh, in music, I think. And, but then he became a tax collector. And uh, obviously then had political inclinations that I never understood, because it's an elected office. 
And he improved the tax collecting from 90% of what was due to 99% of what was due. He didn't make himself so popular with the rich people, uh, but that was the story. And uh, I think he was a, a very wonderful person. I'm very pleased to have had him. The other thing I want to stress about science, that it's essentially international. And so I've had contacts in Japan from very early age. And it's just that you never tell where else in the world someone's going to ask a similar question or feel a similar lack of understanding. And it is, it's also clear that there's, there's a, people benefit enormously from, from the teachers, one of the teachers. And so that's why uh, I uh, exerted a certain pressure. I mean, my feeling for Nevest is that they don't take enough advantage of these prize winners. Well, the prize winners are here. Right? Uh, like this gentleman on my left, uh, Professor Eber. I mean, he's here and active. Okay. But those of us who have gone abroad and come back occasionally, uh, it seems to me you could do more with us. And so uh, I did point out uh, that uh, there's a very famous Chinese Nobel Prize winner whom I happen to know rather well, uh, Chen Ning Yang or Yang Chen Ning, as the Chinese would say, otherwise known to his friends in America as Frank. Um, he had an 80th birthday celebration. I went back to that. It was held in Singapore for a variety of interesting reasons. But while I was there, I gave a talk at his conference in his honor. I was invited out to one of the local high schools. And I was very happy to give a high school talk there. And something, I would have done something similar here with a little more notice uh, in Trinidad. And I, I think it's at that stage. And I myself do remember very vividly uh, a distinguished woman. I mean, who should I know that she was distinguished? She just had interesting things to say while I was a school kid. And uh, that, was, uh, that, that made an impression on me, which I remember to this day. Uh, it turned out, you know, later on, I found out very few she was distinguished and she was well understood and so on and so on, well recognized. But that's sort of irrelevant. The question is, what are the opportunities and uh, what can you understand? So, going back to your original question, nothing that I have done, I would claim, was of much interest to individual people, okay? other than the general contribution of saying, well, how do you understand things? And here's a way of doing it. If I, if I may make a comment in this regard, and I was thinking as Professor Fisher was speaking, there's several things. The first thing is that in science, I like to think of it as a chain linking. Someone can do discover something here, and then that is picked up by somebody else and modified, and picked up by somebody else and modified, or taken in a different direction. And then eventually it reaches the public and has an impact. But then we have to consider where it came from originally. So although you may not be able to say as a natural scientist or you know, working, let's say, on blue sky research, you're not able to say, well, this impacted on that person or this society. It does. It's there. The connection is maybe not overt. But there is a connection. Everything stems from people who develop theory, who do explorations. So that is one. So Professor Fisher, I suspect that whether you know it or not, whether you have traced it or not, your work in 450 articles would have impacted. You may not be able to say it impacted here or there. The next point you made is about the training of students. The fact that Arthur was able to come up become a tax collector is because he took that scientific training and applied it to tax collection. And I could speak personally on that because I'm a chemist and a statistician. I, I too am a physical chemist, more physical organic though, and a statistician. And what I have done, my interests recently are all in socio-research, socio-environmental, socio-agricultural, because I've taken that scientific rigor and applied it to things like focus groups, designing surveys, analyzing surveys, developing indexes, etc. So the thing about a science training is that it gives you a, a rigor in the way you think that you can take from discipline to discipline.
So when you train students, and you'll be perfectly correct, students are influenced by and impacted by. So your 30 graduate students, your uh, 50 postdocs, whom you've mentored, have all been impacted. And then when they go on and impact people, and they go on and impact people, it's a chain reaction. But not exactly a chain reaction, but it's like a tree spreading. You know. So let me say, thank you for your impact. And I also take a point about influencing young people by just being an interesting character. And that you are. <laughs> so, about coming down to talk to the Yes, we'll make sure we will follow up on that for sure. I'll thank you again, Professor Fisher. I'm sure exactly what I'm leading it to you today. You probably have done that to one of the young people in our in our crowd right there. There's a young man there. I'm not too sure what his age is. He looks about 12. <laughs> Sorry, I'm sure you may have an impact on it. Yes, exactly. Well, at this point in time, I'd like to invite everybody to join. We'll have a brief intermission. I'd like to invite everybody to join us poolside for some light refreshments, at which point you can continue your conversations with our icons and science on the poolside in a more casual setting. So please, please join us outside. <laughs>